Cecilia Wall, and I am at the Kansas City Public Library's Plaza branch. We are so excited that you are joining us for 929, the minutes that move Kansas City. This is our live panel, and right now I am joined by Carrie Coogan, Deputy Director here for Kansas City Public Libraries. And Carrie, we are so excited to be here. You're hosting us for this really important conversation tonight. Why was it important and vital for you guys at the library to be part of this? Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here and welcome to you and to all of your team and to our partners at KCUR as well. We're so thrilled to have you here tonight at the library. Um, it's really important to have this conversation for us because um, the library is a place that we really believe is a place to have these kinds of conversations, to collaborate, to partner, to come and to share our thoughts, our feelings, our fears, and come together as a community and really work together to see if we can find common ground, see if we can solve these problems. This is the place to do it. The library is the place. What was some of the response you guys at the library got after the death of George Floyd as we were witnessing all those protests? Well, I have to say that it was really difficult here at the library because, as we all know, the library was closed. And normally this is a place where people could come in. We would have programs here in this very space. We would talk about it. Um, but since we were closed, it was more difficult. So we reached out as much as we could. Uh, we held um, forums online. We had programs online. And then we also did book lists for people um, to read more about this, to educate themselves to learn more and not just for adults but for children and teens as well because as we all know it wasn't just adults who were affected by this but children as well and teenagers so we wanted to be a real asset to the community and to be able to share and 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 help people find information about what was going on and alleviate fears and, and make sure that people knew they could have a conversation about these things. And some good news, the Kansas City Public Library is reopening. That's right. We're so excited to say that we're opening back up June 1st, which is next Tuesday, and we're really thrilled to open up all of our locations and be available um, for, for most all services. Um, and we're really excited to welcome everybody back. So please come back to your library. Carrie Coogan, Deputy Director here for the Kansas City Public Library. Now, we're going to take you back to 929, the minutes that move Kansas City. Nine minutes. 29 seconds. Mama. Of pleading. Please, the medic. And pain. I'm through. Until his last breath. You hear me, man? <laughs> Igniting a renewed movement here in Kansas City. What's his name? George Floyd! What's his name? George Floyd! I'm tired. We're all tired. We just want justice. That's all we ask asking for. No lives matter! No lives matter! No lives matter! I want this to be peaceful and I want it to be successful. But more importantly, voices need to be heard. Freedom is for everyone. The call for justice for George Floyd continues today as protesters return to the streets here in Kansas City. Hopefully, if we make enough noise, it'll make a difference. When do we want justice? When do we want it now? You can't just ignore it. It's happening and you hear it. George Floyd died on May 25th, 2020, Memorial Day. Just days later, this was Kansas City. I'm tired of seeing black bodies on the ground as a result of the police. One of the things that struck me was the diversity of the crowd, how many young people I saw. A lot of people we talked to said, we just want them to hear us. A year later, we went to the people who spent those summer days in the streets. I was worried about getting back in that space again. What space? Of just the pain, of the hurt, of the thinking about my son. If you ain't got the to protect the streets and protect and serve like you was paid to do, turn to your damn back. They sprayed my daughter first at point blank range with a K9 fogger. And then they sprayed me and just kind of pulled me out into the street. What stood out to you from those moments? I would say, uh, the emotion, just the tenacity of the protesters, like, no, we, we won't change, we demand change. This was, for Kansas City, one of the first times that we were the target of the frustration. Several bottles have been thrown at many of the officers right now. As a result, there have been about a half dozen arrests so far. Just watching it, both as a journalist and as a viewer, and as a black man, um, to have to, 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 to watch them through those three prisms, can be exhausting, man. But for me, it wasn't what it looked like, Kevin. 
It was what it sounded like. Mama. When George Floyd called for his mama, every mother knows what that sounds like. As a black woman, do the struggles, do, does the message hit home a little more poignantly for you? I have a 17-year-old son, it absolutely does, because I'm out here for him. There's many great things we have about our city uh, when it comes to uh, um, racial inequality, that is one of the, the biggest areas of growth we have to, in our city to overcome. It's like... <laughs> There's so many people there and I was just happy that everybody could come together. That's a story they could tell generations, like that's really exciting. Often it has been criminalized just to be black and existing in America. We need a lot more of the listen to the pain people are experiencing and figuring out how do we solve these problems from here. And have conversation um, where hearts can be moved and then policies can, can change from that. Welcome. We are so excited to be joined by our esteemed panel. We have Carlos Moreno, journalist for KCUR, Bukeka Blakemore, protester, activist here in Kansas City. You may know this guy, the Kansas City Mayor, Quentin Lucas. We have Chris Lynn Huff, the owner of RE Store right there on the Country Club Plaza, and Captain Jeffrey Hewley from the Kansas City Police Department. Thank you all for being here. I want to start by asking, kind of looking back, reliving some of those moments, what was it like? Chrissy, I'll start with you. Um, it's hard to go back to put yourself back, um, you know, in those moments, I think, because for one, you know, it's like anything that's painful, you know, stepping back into it always is hard. But I think that um, our immediate reaction within the first, I mean, we were there at five o'clock in the morning. We were literally the first two people that the police department let in, Jeff and I. And the first reaction that we had um, that next morning, um, we were, you know, still trying to grasp everything that had happened the, the day on Monday. And I think we were just, there, it was just the most trauma that I remember experiencing as a human in, in our community. Um, I didn't, I, you know, I was, I was an adult during 9-11, but I didn't live there and I didn't know anyone there. But for some reason, this just felt like it was part of all of us. And I think, I, honestly, the thing that I finally have come to grips with on that is that I think because I'm a mom and because I have two grown sons and then, um, you know, I think that, that the thought of being that mom mm. is it just it was more than I really could really let myself even go into. You know, motherhood is the, the thread that runs through all three of the women on stage, Bukeka. You know, when we sat down to interview, you talked about how you felt for your son. One thing that touched me was you sounded so tired mm. of being on this loop. Uh, you've been in the activism game for a long time. Mm -hmm. What made this particular protest different? Well, it's the fact that there were so many more people involved than before and you didn't feel like you were by yourself and that's what helped me because I wasn't sure what I could do or when I could do it because it was so clinching but I began to feel better because there were so many people that were outside of what you would, might normally see in terms of protest that I felt supported and um, but it, it, what, it is tiring and uh, because you do, you're, it's decade after decade after decade mm -hmm. that you find yourself having to relive it. One of our partners for this project is KCUR. Carlos Moreno, you took some amazing images. If you've seen the open and some of the imagery, those are all your photos. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you experiencing this as a journalist behind the lens? Because we have a very unique position and role <laughs> to play in how we document this. It, it was a. It was a phenomenal experience for me. Even I've been through a lot of protests and I've covered a lot of news events over you know a 35-year career, and I've, to see protests on this scale was 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 amazing. It was an, it was a totally different experience than something I've I've done before, 
and it was a learning experience. I kept learning as I went throughout this protest, and it was fascinating to me to see this protest evolve and change as tactics change for everyone, for police and protesters. It was, it was, it was a unique experience to, to watch it unfold in front of me. And one of the things that Chrissy mentioned, as in terms of learning, I'm learning more about my community through this event. On Sunday morning, I had to go into the plaza just to look around and see the effects of the night before. And a woman stepped out of her car, I just happened to be walking by, a woman stepped out of her car, she had tears in her eyes, and she said, what happened to my city? And she, she experienced some deep, deep tragedy that it, it, it sunk in with me then. It hadn't sunk into me yet until I saw tears from her face. That, oh, powerful. If you guys would speak up a little bit so we can make sure everybody can hear you. You know, I got the booming voice <laughs> because I'm used to projecting, but we want to make sure everybody can hear you guys. We talk about the city. Um, Mr. Mayor, you had a very unique role to play in all of this. You were out sharing messages in support of the protesters. But then you also spent a whole lot of nights calling for calm because we know things did get violent. It was one of those surprising things that you don't expect. I have still not been mayor that long. And at that point, I really had not been mayor that long. We were already battling a pandemic and then seeing protests of this level was something deep to me. I think something I agree with was exhaustion. When I saw the murder of George Floyd, I, I processed it, processed it as, as a man, as a black man, as a person, as somebody like that. And in many ways wanted to have that experience uniquely, not as mayor, not mm -hmm. as person who is working with the police, talking to the protesters, doing all of that. So we saw that level of balance, but I did think that it was something special for Kansas City in the sense that voices were finally heard. We've always taken pride in Kansas City in some ways of, of not being, perhaps, you've always been loud, I'm sure, but not being <laughs> a, as loud and not listening as much as we need to. Right. I was glad folks had to listen. I'm glad we're still talking about it because yes. frankly, you know, you can't keep your head in the sand forever. No. And I think this was a real opening for a lot of people to support, to hear, to, to really be part of how we can do better. I'm going to let you all in on a little bit of a secret. So when we partnered with KCUR, the leaders got together and said, oh, we want to do something. And we were talking about how do you break down something so large that has impacted our community in such a meaningful way. And the thing that I wanted to do was I looked at all these great images and photos and video, and I said, I want to go back to the people who were there. And I want to get the widest net, the greatest collection of people that I can. And so I went through hours of video that 41 Action News got, photos from KCUR. And you know who I kept seeing? You, Captain. <laughs> you were all over the place, OK? You were talking to people in the streets. You were sitting at the table with people yelling at you nonstop. Let's just call it what it was. What prompted you to want to be part of it? Because in our interview, you said you would have stayed there all night if you could have. Um, empathy and perspective. So the empathy. Uh, it's not taught. You either have it or you don't. We all have sympathy or we can be sympathetic for individuals, but as all of you uh, spoke on earlier, I viewed it through the lens of two different lenses. The lens of a black man in America, as well as the uh, lens of a black police commander also. So I felt it necessary to be empathetic towards the community who were in need at the time. And no, I couldn't answer all their, their questions, but Sometimes people just want to vent and a lot of times in our profession, just the core nature of our job, we show up to listen to respond. A lot of times we don't show up to listen and understand. So if I can carve out that little bit of incremental time on that day we were there for the, the Unity March, I would have stayed there all night and talked to as many people as I can because I want to understand your, your pain and your hurt because I also feel the same as you do. So I don't want the uniform that I put on every day for work to be a barrier, I want you to know that we just filled out different job applications. But the same thing, the same passion that you have as a resident, I do have that also, and I share your concerns. So that's, that's just who I am. But I'm not, the, I'm not unique in that perspective. There's plenty of officers across this department, across this country, who share that same mindset. But it just in th those moments, I felt it necessary to be there. Hmm. Chrissy, when we were talking, you said that that moment, seeing that video and the reaction was a breaking point. It was and, a breaking and, point. And you talked about the fact that you feel like for the first time, white people felt that. I, th I think 
I had people say, well, I didn't watch it or I'm not going to watch it. And my response was, you need to watch it. Mm. And we need to watch it and we need to watch all the other stuff and we need to read the books and we need to go back and watch the movies and we need to inundate ourselves with edu educate ourselves and inundate that information because we don't have an idea. We don't have a clue what it is. And for us to act like we have any right in the situation is not okay. And that was the breaking point for me was, um, um, it, I think it was one of your reporters had decided to come down and talk to me that morning. And my daughter, my daughter's a pastor um, in Olathe, Kansas, and she was with me and she was like, mom, you need to know what you're gonna say before you get on TV today. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know what to talk, I, I was, that's what I was doing. Like, I, 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 and she said, you can't talk about the business, you can't talk about anything that you feel upset about. And I don't even remember what I said. And so as a person of faith, I will say that I know the words came that were supposed to come out of me. And I remember, I do remember saying that I didn't care about the, the window. I didn't care about my windows. I didn't care about the rocks. I didn't care about the, we plywood board our building ourselves because they told us to. I didn't care about any of it. I mean, they could have broke all my windows and I wouldn't care because it was a human. It was just another, per it was just a human who was gone. Still emotional. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a year and I still will cry. I cried last night, you know, because I cry because I don't understand. In the soul of me, in the deep part of me, I will never understand and that, makes me sad. Mukeka, one thing jumped out. You said that people like Quentin need to be in a position to have conversations where hearts and minds can be moved. And yes. from that, that's where you want to see policy come in. That's where I want to see policy come in. I don't see how you can have effective change if you're not affected. Yes. If you don't understand how it affects everyone. Right. Once you see how it affects everyone, then you have to, or you hope to, have policies that support the greater good. Um, and I think that we're in a, in a real crossroads right now because there are people who feel that, well, my greater good is better than your greater good. Mm -hmm. And so how do you deal with that? Well, it, it, it gets right back to, to the heart because we're all mothers, we're all fathers, we all want to have good for our children. But if you don't take the stance to make sure that all of the children are taken care of, then your children are not going to thrive. You're not, your children are not going to be in a position where they can speak from the heart because you're not speaking from the heart. Please, please feel free to join our conversation, share your questions. If it's for someone specific up here, feel free, let me know. I'm happy to ask it. We want to get you engaged and part of this conversation as well. Mr. Mayor, when you hear that, how does that influence how you make policy? You need to, to be good at the job, you need to be able to listen. You need to be able to listen to different people and you need to be able to process it and keep moving. One of the more interesting challenges, and I'll, I'll be straight up, you have empathy for everybody whose voices you're hearing, all the passion you're hearing, but you also know Hughley. You also know store owners. You, you know that this city is, the city, this region, right, is more than just what you are walking in and walking through. So my North Star always was, how can I be honest? Mm. And how can I share that we are listening even if there is not change happening today, tomorrow, next year. So what I, I try to tell people, there are a bunch of things we can do. There are a bunch of things I cannot do right now. That doesn't mean we're ignoring it. doesn't mean we're ignoring you. It means that a lot of those folks whose voices were being heard a year ago today are those same voices that are in my mind as we keep moving. And honestly, you may not believe it, 
They're the same voices that are in Hughley's mind sometimes and others as they're thinking about situations I think that we all confront each and every day. And that's the only way that, that I can uh, experience it and I think share it. It's one of those where it's real hard uh, to just every press conference or something. And a lot of time in the press, yeah, I don't like run my whole press conference. You talk so, long. So, you know, <laughs> I'll just say that know that you made an impact, right? Know for all those people out there. You know, we, we were listening and it's still having an impact. Captain Hughley, I want to come to you because obviously a lot of this conversation has to do with police reform. Mm -hmm. Um, reimagining policing. When you hear that, what does it mean to you? What are the changes that you feel like need to happen in order to bring more of that kinship back between the police department and parts of our community? I think some of the changes actually have happening and we're on the road to additional changes happening. But Mayor Q, he's a, one of our board of police commissioners and I know they made the changes of um, Missouri State Highway Patrol, they investigate our officer involved shootings now. And there's been other incremental changes along the way, but we can't stop there, essentially. I mean, we can look in the mirror so long and reflect on what happened over the past year, but metaphorically, if you spend too much time in a rear view mirror, you're gonna crash hit a tree. Mm -hmm. So you can't reflect on where you've been and what's coming up on you too long. Sometimes you gotta look out the window and think about the right reason, the reason you're doing this job, right? So you have people out there who are asked to be police different. You have people out there asking and demanding changes, and at some point we'll have to take a seat at the table and listen to some of them. So there, there's been some things done which are good, but there's still always work to be done. We'll, we'll, never, we'll never be perfect, unfortunately. There's always a human factor in the, the job that we do, but we can strive for perfection. We can strive to do better. We can strive for the greater good. You talked about looking at the protests and being encouraged. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people told me they were surprised to hear a police officer say that. Well, think about this, right? So <clears throat> it's, it's always the youth who we pass the torch down to. Mm -hmm. So I won't be here forever. None of us will be on this mm -hmm. stage forever. Mm -hmm. There's a future mayor in that crowd. There's a future captain in that crowd. There's a future journalist in that crowd, future business owner. So why should I hamper or why should I put their light out now? just because I, I may not agree with what they're doing. See, the problem is things have become too polar, polarized and we need to focus on people. People are what's important. The industry doesn't matter, right? It's the people. So the youth are no doubtably, undoubtedly the future. And if they feel strong and passionate about something, I'm not gonna stand in their way. Right. I mean, we need to change more things in this city besides um, construction design, and <laughs> landscaping and everything Except else. Except the potholes, we need those fixed. So, I mean, so it's, at some I'm point, we ha they, they may have a fresh idea that That's right. That's we may right. not have thought of. So if, if we create that radically inclusive environment, yes. get them a seat at the table. Right. Right? Yes. So diver diversity is important, right? But diversity means nothing without inclusion. So include, those, include them in the conversations. Yes, we will agree to disagree on some things, and we will have to negotiate on some things, but at least we hear you, hmm. we'll consider that. And that, it may be that, hey, that was a good idea. We're so, we suffer so much from group things sometimes in, our, in policing or any in, in history that a lot of times we don't allow that outside influence to come in. But the, the moment we do and we hold these town hall type meetings, yeah, we won't like everything everybody has to say, but it hmm. comes with the job. Throughout history, everybody hasn't always liked the policing. And, that's just, that just comes with the territory, right? But we still have to provide a platform for they can, where they can be heard. So moving forward, I, don't, I can't make this decision, but I wouldn't be against having town hall type discussions. And that's when anything happens across the country because uh, the grassroots movements, yes. the activists and everything else, they've already told you they're not taking this anymore. So it's a matter of time before the protests happen. It's a matter of time before they're at the, the, the doorsteps. So why not provide a form and let's talk about what happened in Seattle or wherever it is. Don't wait for it right. to brew out of control. Get in front of it. Have that conversation, have that dialogue. That way you implement changes here in Kansas City. That way you implement changes in whatever department before it's too late. You get on the front side of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the Midwest came out. He oh, said, that away. <laughs> right, yeah. 
I'm, I, I got I got talking and you know. I respect it. That's what we're here for. It. And, and, and that's one of the things. You know, <laughs> in researching some of this for for some of these stories, I I, I came across uh, a pithy quote from a, a management consultant, uh, Reg, uh, Reg Reavens. And he said, the, the pace of uh, the acquisition of knowledge, acquisition of learning, has to be greater than or equal to the rate of change. Right. And that's kind of what that's you've all really said good. to some degree, is that we're talking about having to grasp and, and obtain all this knowledge and learn from these different people that we've been talking to. And every time I went on an interview for these stories, someone I had all these questions lined up, and everyone gave me a very different answer, and everyone gave me an enlightened answer. Because I kind of expected to get some pat answers every time I went out, but I kept getting different answers. There's such a range mm -hmm. of opinions and ideas from a range of people. I mean, that's one of the goals of this too, was to get a diverse voices in our stories: conservative, uh, left, right, middle, young, old, uh, black and white, brown, right. and and the opinions that came from these voices astounded me. Because you know, again, echo chamber I th or groupthink. I thought I had the ideas already in my head when I went to go interview these people, and no, they always fed me fresh material to think about. Carlos, I have another question for you. So. <laughs> Part of the special, you know, me and Kevin sit down. I don't do that. That's a very uncomfortable place for me to be. I'm just going to let y'all know. Um, a lot has changed in how we cover protests, particularly surrounding Black Lives Matter, the push for social and racial justice. I feel like you now have equity, diversity, inclusion, all at the forefront. How has it changed the way you guys at KCUR approach not just this issue, but every issue? It's, it's forced us to look inward, to look inside our, our, our own building and examine how we do conduct our interviews, who we talk to, especially the different voices that we collect. You know, that's one of the things, it's actually a, an initiative we've started just within the past week or so, wow. how we are going to examine the voices, the people that we interview, the, the, the people that, the perspectives that we obtain for our stories, for the way we tell our stories. So that's, it's been a huge impact for us. Bukeka, do you feel like your voice has been heard? The voice of the people who are in the streets has been heard? I do. I feel like they've been heard. And in a way, I believe that it will, there's still obviously a lot more to say. And in, in that same frame, we're looking at voices, as you were saying, from different perspectives. You know, I was telling you about my, my father. You know, he was in the civil rights era and he uh, looks at mostly everything from a historical perspective, okay? But my son, who is, you know, just a 30-ish, a, a uh, he looks at everything from the future, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, as, as to what you were saying, so to be able to have those different types of voices be heard is very important. Um, and I, I, I think this is uh, an, a, an opportunity to, for those people who felt like they didn't have a voice, speak it now here here's your here's your here's here's your platform don't be afraid you're supported there are more people in the conversation and so you you can feel more at ease that your voice will be heard mm. mayor lucas you were pretty proud of some of the initiatives some of the steps that have been taken in the last year why don't you go ahead and give me a few of them Captain Hughley already mentioned one i think uh, having an outside agency that investigates officer involved shootings was important I think we've made some other accountability steps with the department's relationship with the city. That was way back last summer. We continue to have those conversations now. Uh, I think that we have continued on the legislative side to decriminalize a lot of the issues that got people wrapped up into the system. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people were saying that my daily black life is made more difficult for these sorts of things that shouldn't be tripping me up, shouldn't be getting me this record, shouldn't be having me live in some sort of fear and yeah. being treated differently. Yeah. I remember when I went to college, I was talking to some other students and they said, yeah, I got a warning on a ticket. I'm like, what's a warning? I don't even know what that's about. You just you either get a ticket or you don't, right? I've had a few warnings in my day. Yeah, man, you know? So I was kind of like, this is, this is kind of interesting. I think we have done a lot of steps to try to get to a point where we are, and I've said it a few times, decriminalizing poverty, decriminalizing some parts of existence that aren't some of the violent types of things we do. Because what I believe builds stronger community connections with us is when you do have folks not feeling like there is that antagonism. 
And, and, and what's more, it really isn't just a policing issue, and this isn't to be a, a cop-out, pardon the pun, from all the changes that we need to make and reform. When I was at the protest and actually could talk to people uh, and had a real conversation, I talked to young brothers who were asking me about jobs. Mm -hmm. I talked to young folks who were asking me about, I've never been listened to. Mm. I was talking to folks who were talking to me about music. Mm. I mean, there is, there is just so much more to it. And I don't think they ever thought a mayor would listen to them. Mm. I don't think maybe they ever thought Captain Hughley would actually be like, no, I want to hear what you have to say. And I think to break down so many barriers, we need to keep doing that time and time again. And that's still not going to be perfect. but. I don't think, and Lord knows, I spend my day thinking about policies, interesting ones, controversial ones. It's not going to be a policy suite that makes a difference. It's going to be letting everyone know that our law enforcement, our leadership, others are of the community, are for the community, and are actually trying to make sure we're pushing it forward, not somebody who's antagonizing it or in this group that's different. So we have partnered with KCUR for this project, 929. And as part of their reporting, they collected a very diverse group of voices. Let's hear from a few of them. And the George Floyd thing was just the last straw for me. I just think that a lot of people hit their breaking point. I thought like, how long is this gonna keep happening? You know, I thought, you know, when is the end? When is enough enough, you know? I just... Uh... Black lives! Black lives! I see this man calling out for his mother. Mm. To see this man who can barely breathe. To see this man who has died while basically in the custody of those who are charged with protecting and serving him. And to see that he looks like me. It's hurtful. Very. Black I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. George Floyd, I feel terrible about what happened. He should never have died that way. But he also should never have gone into the store trying to use fake money when the cops caught him. But he should have sat there and paid attention and listened. And, you know, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're breathing enough to talk and go on and on and on and cry about your mom and everything. He should have just sat there and he'd probably still be alive today. I just, I think that the chaos that was created around that was, again, that the media was pushing this narrative that law enforcement is bad. I, I don't believe we have a race problem. I really and truly don't. I really and truly don't. It has been driven by the media for as long as I've been alive. Some really diverse voices there, Carlos. Um, people oh. saying they feel like all of the protests, all of the outrage, all of the heartache was really driven by the media. Um, they feel like the media has been pushing a certain narrative for generations. Or another woman who said that George Floyd was breathing well enough to talk. Yeah. And he should have just relaxed. <laughs> and that would have been the end of it. Talk to me about the wide range of perspectives you got. Oh, goodness. I mean, we started with some of the young people. And, and, uh, and one of the, uh, actually, let me start with an anecdote. I, I was walking through the park on that Saturday night. And I heard someone go, Mr. Moreno. And I turned and found, I used to be a high school English teacher. I've turned to find some of my former students. And my first, my first um, reaction was, you guys got to get out of here. It's not safe. But then I realized, oh, you're college students you know, now. And it's, it's OK to be here. And, and those voices, I, I was reminded by Randy Fickey, the, the pastor at, uh, at um, Unity, uh, Southeast. Unity Southeast, that a lot of these young people, they've only known a black president, mostly, for most of their sure. lives. And their perspective on the presidency is something entirely different than us on Absolutely. the stage. So that was a huge awakening for me to understand that perspective. But then again, I talked to this older gentleman who I met at Westport last summer, um, 68, I think, I can't remember his age. And, and he was very angry at police. When I met him in Westport, he was very, very angry at police. A white, angry man in a wheelchair and he, he just spewed some vitriol, and I came back to visit him this year. I was able to find him and track him down this year. 
he's still angry and he's, he said he's paranoid. And I heard that reaction from many people, not just white, but many black people also gave me this paranoid description of their lives. So some, and in between that, we heard conservative voices, people who don't believe there's racism in this country. So, I mean, the, the voices range so wildly, sometimes it was really hard to collect it and decide what is it we're gonna tell our audience mm. and, and what is that narrative we're gonna put out there. So mm. that was a hard, those were hard decisions for us to make, what voices to include and explain to our audience that need to be heard. Okay, can I see your face? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, about, I thought about that on the way here. You know, we, we live on a foundation or in a foundation where racism is a part, it, it is a bedrock of that foundation. Okay? Explain. Well, it's like if you're, if you're a fish in the ocean, you don't know that you're in the ocean, okay? <laughs> We are, right? We are in a, in, in, in a soup of racism, okay? And so people who are not affected by that, because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're benefiting from it, or just that that's it, you don't even have a word for it. Of course they don't think that there's racism, because that is not in their consciousness that that is something um, that exists because it's not happening to them. It's not affecting them. So when people say, well, you're racist because you have this view of black people or brown people or whatever, it's, they, they don't recognize that because that's their, that, that, is their, that is the soup that they live in. That is the ocean that they are in. Mm. So what do you do with that uh, when you are the, the, the person that is affected by that? Um, and that's what we're in, and that's why we're having these conversations. Um, I have had some really deep experiences with friends that may be watching right now. Um, and they didn't know, or they didn't recognize, or, or, the, or it dawned on them like, uh, yep, I have had racist thoughts. I'm sorry, you know, Bukeka. I've been in those situations where it's like, well, we'll call Bukeka because she's black and she'll tell us exactly what we need to do. Who we? Yeah. And I know I got some girlfriends have a girl, why'd you call me out like that? <laughs> so, um, you know, but it, 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 nonetheless, nonetheless, this experience here is what is going to move us forward. And it's going to bubble up all the vegetables in the soup <laughs> and all the ingredients and uh, and hopefully we'll have something that is um, more uh, tasty. <laughs> more flavorful? More, for everybody? Yeah, for, spicy. for everybody. Uh, yes. Chrissy, when we sat down in your store, you know, you kind of talked about some of the history mm -hmm. of your location and being on the plaza and really wanting to open your doors to be more of a meeting place and to be more of a gathering place. Talk to me about why that was important for you. Well, obviously, uh, if you don't know the history of the plaza, yeah. um, you can DM me. I'll give you. I'll send you some links. <laughs> um, um, but the history of the my building that I'm in specifically was the very first building built. It was built in 1925. It was the first project, um, and the history of things that you know were going on and how some of that money came in and different things were directly, and the person who built it, directly affected much of our society in and around downtown. Um, all of the redlining, all of the things that happened during that time in that 1920s to 40s and 50s, um, he was very responsible for. Um, so we just, we knew and felt like we needed to find a way to use our space for something different, not just for doing business, you know? Um, and so we had already, I have already friend, very good friends with um, Katie, who is one of the founders of the Truist Collective, and just said, you know, 
we weren't having an art fair because of the pandemic. And so I said, well, what if we did our, since we're open, what if we just brought the art in and we featured black artists and we just had their art here and just like let them be here and let them talk to people and let them share their paint. You know, their art is so reflective of things. And if you are, because I started my business in vintage, I'm a student of history. So history is important to me and I love history and I know a lot about furniture and those kind of things. But the other part of history is that art and writing are the things that really tell us the story in history. And so rhetoric is what white people like myself grew up with. And we were taught in school and through pictures and through art and through stories what there, that there was a difference between black and white people. Um, I'm 52 years old. I, was, I graduated high school in 87. So I'm totally in that era, era of there were not black faces in my textbooks. And when I look at history, the way to change history is to change that rhetoric. My, one of my biggest and most important things that I wanna say is, dear white people, <laughs> read the stories and look at the art and go to the artists now and look at their art and let them tell you why there's 40 black faces in a painting, why each pa picture, each face has a different eye you know, or eyes, because there's different types of pain in that picture. And those things, especially during this pandemic where so many people were locked up, there's a lot of pain that's coming out in that art. And so we, we're doing it again this year. We're going to feature all black artists and we're have, the art fair is open, this year, is gonna be open. And so we are hoping to have just beautiful, incredible art there that will hopefully reflect some encouragement too. Um, I know that it's not going to change tomorrow. And it is uncomfortable to be in this situation and in to have these conversations, especially for someone who others look at as someone maybe who is entitled because of um, my color. And I am determined to take that away, whatever it takes. I don't want my grandkids to see that I had an opportunity to do something and didn't do it. I don't want them to do that. My grandkids were the kids on the end of the special last mm -hmm. night where there was the little white boy and the two little brown girls. And the two little brown girls are adopted granddaughters of mine. And they went to the Sunday protest my sons and their families and their babies. And I want them, when they look at that picture, the reason that I black and whited that picture is because I wanted them to be all one thing. I just wanted them to be people together. I didn't want it to be a colored picture where they, their difference is shown. I just wanted them to be together. They love each other. They don't care. I don't care. I don't care about you, you, you. I don't care about anybody. We're human beings, and it has to stop. White people, we got to stop. Mm. <laughs> Catherine Hubley, I got to come to you. Okay. A lot of this centers around reaction to some of these videos, right? Mm -hmm. You were really open and, and candid about your feelings seeing the George Floyd video. But I think you talked about the community has a right to also hold the police department accountable. Right. How does the everyday citizen do that? So, from a formality speaking, we have an Office of Citizen Complaints, or Office of Community Complaints, whether, where you can file that complaint online, you can go to any station and file that complaint, you can even make a complaint on the phone with the Office of City Complaints. Uh, you can go to any police station, or if you're on a call for service, you can always ask for a supervisor. There's always a sergeant on scene, there's always a captain or a commander on scene. That way you get the answers that you need in those moments. So you, you can follow up afterwards, or in those moments, you can always ask for a superior, but never be afraid to hold us accountable. I asked you before, I'm gonna ask you again. Mm -hmm. How do we create more of the culture and relationship? 
I would say um, culture, 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 it matters, right? And none of it matters without building relationships first because relationship building is the foundation of anything that's personal or professional. So we have to start with relationship building. You know, look at, look at our mission, vision, and values. What are they? Do they align with what the community needs are? And if not, we need to adjust and get there. Hmm. And further than that, I would say trust after relationship building. Because you, we can start building trust, but if there's no relationship there, then it's, it's null and void, and it's not sustainable. So sustainability is key. But we have to be genuine. We have to be authentic in the process. Because, of course, we're going we're to get why now. And rightfully so, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, why now? So we have to be vulnerable in that, in that process. And yeah, vulnerability starts with feelings on both sides. But after we get our feelings on the table, it starts with thinking and it starts with doing. So we have to be vulnerable, we have to be authentic, we have to build relationships, and then from that work on building sustainable trust. Mayor Lucas, we gotta come to you. You took a pretty bold action, you and the city council last mm -hmm. week. Um, talk to me about why, happened pretty quick, and what you hope to achieve from it. You know, a few different things, first of all. I Wait, think let me back up taking $42.7 million and putting it under, go ahead and explain it for the folks who may not well, be Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think there have been a lot of distortions of what it is, but it's, it's very simply this. Um, we're required to give a certain amount under state law to the police department. We typically give more than that. I think city council has an interest in making sure that that money, which will still go to the Kansas City Police Department, is something where we can actually speak to and answer to some of that accountability that people have been asking for for 80 years. Mm some of that accountability and saying, what are you all doing? How do we make sure that we're supporting things that actually are already done? Crisis intervention team, right? Our community interaction officers. A lot of the efforts that I know the captain and so many others have worked on for years. We wanna make sure that those continue to exist because one thing that I think has frustrated myself, council, and if I'm being honest, everybody who lives in neighborhoods impacted by violent crime in this city is when we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, well, maybe it'll get better one day and act like there's not more that we can do, right? And I think that to me, just saying, well, you know, we signed a check a while back and we'll check in in a year and kind of see what happened, that ain't accountability. And I think a mistake that was made when we were talking about protests was that we were divorcing protest and action and engagement from safety in our community. Right. We are safer if people have trust, we are safer if people feel comfortable. We are safer if everybody feels like we are all at least going in the same path, if not necessarily on the same team. And so that is what we saw. We have seen the, the typical blowback that we saw last summer that we've seen in a lot of ways. When folks just stand up and say, I wanna be heard. When folks stand up and say, we want to have our voices heard, then you've seen significant discussion. Why do I think it's important? I think it's vital because I want to be able to give that answer to people. You know, I don't like talking to mothers of homicide victims. I don't think any officer does, nobody does, and just kind of saying, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And then me going back and saying, well, I have a ribbon cutting somewhere, so that's what I'm gonna focus on as a mayor. And that's no shade on anybody else, but it's kind of like, I got only so much time to make a difference here. And I'm gonna make sure that we do something with that. But if you want my biggest reason for this, I'm tired of seeing people get killed. I'm tired of people getting shot. Mm. And I think that it is time for us to lead in this city in a way that is different. This is not a defund. This is not money going anywhere else. I wrote the ordinances. And the ordinances put the money back in can only go to the Kansas City Police Department. But it is important that we see, all right, where does it go? How does it build this? How do we ask next year, the year after, how we're doing better? How do we have some of these other voices here mm -hmm. that feel like, you know what, if I don't like what Lucas and the crew did, I can get rid of Lucas and the crew. Something which is not the situation we have right now. Yeah. And so you can get rid of me, but it's not relating to policing use. I think that's the sort of thing that we are talking about. And I think that will be an amazing transformative difference. Because the captain can tell we do a number of things that are good that probably need to be amplified and need to be doubled in terms of humanizing, not just our officers, but humanizing our community. I'll make one last point. During the protests, I, I gave away my cell phone number long before. Craziest idea I've ever had, but it's been interesting. And I had an, an officer's spouse who sent me this message and, and she described her husband going off 
to the city every day is almost like it's going off to war. Sure. And I'm, I respect his service, I respect their family. But if you feel like the community that you're policing in is nothing but a war zone, if that's what you think of and that's what you're feeling, we're gonna keep having some of these same problems forever. And so I think what we need to do is humanize our community connections. That's what I hope this is a step in doing for the first time in four generations. And it's not wild that you were talking about the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, right? How these things that are vested in back then, it is time for us to at least open up, think about them, see what can change, see where we can do better. Right. And maybe that starts to change some things in this community. It's accountability and that we don't have we literally, I, I've been in business 10 years in Kansas City and this is the first time that I've ever been invited to have a conversation with a mayor or a member of the police department. And as a business owner, I've had numerous times where I would have loved to had the conversation or a five minutes of an ear for, of a policeman. Um, you know, I, I host probably 20 to 30,000 people through my business on the plaza a year. I have the largest footprint down there. And so that's a lot of people that are coming into my space and seeing a representation of my city, this place that I love. And to know for 10 years that, you know, it's been really hard to have conversation. I would say that I feel the protests that was the greatest thing that came out of the protest was it was the first time that I felt like I could walk up to a police officer and have a conversation because they were there, they were all over the place and I was able to check on them. Are you guys doing okay? We have a restroom if you need to borrow it, those kind of things. Never have I felt that way in 10 years. And I don't, I don't think it's, I'm not, that's not a fault, I'm not giving fault to anyone for that. But to me, I feel, better today than I felt a year ago. And okay. I would, just oh. to jump in real quick, I would echo that. So we all know, we've all been in Kansas City long enough. Kansas City is extremely large, 320 square miles, but extremely diverse, but yet segregated. Right. So the only thing we traditionally came together for was sports. Oh yeah. Youth sports, <laughs> professional sports. But since the protest, I would echo that the plaza, the parks, the coffee shops, um, these they're diverse now yes there's a yeah. mixed group of people outside of the concerted effort the intentionality of to make a difference they would have never crossed spaces or crossed paths and now maybe she's meeting people in business maybe she didn't meet before we are seeing a very diverse customer change so that, awesome. that's that's the one positive thing that's come out of yeah the, that's the I, I think the protests you know obviously any pain or mm -hmm. suffering that happened from those we no one wanted to see that but those conversations that came from that and the young people i think you know that was an there was also an embarrassment a little bit to someone my age you know you know get your crap together because you've got 15 to 20 year old kids are staying down there 30 and 40 hours at a time um you know what are you doing mm -hmm. okay i'm just gonna say when you were talking about your grandbabies or your your yeah okay you know we are so beautiful in our array of color mm -hmm. and it's not by accident that we have this beautiful array of color and when when you said you know i i you know i, I don't care you know what what color you are and that's and, and i get that but i just want to pivot a little bit to man, I care about the fact that you are a brown baby and that you are a yellow baby and that you are a white baby. Gosh, look at the array mm. of beauty that is showing up in the colors that we can even see in the lights. And that way, I think that when we uh, begin to see the, the, uh, the array of skin as beautiful and diverse and excuse me but god created mm. then we don't ever have to feel like um i i, I don't i don't see color yes we see color right. and it's beautiful and it's grand and it is exactly the way that we are supposed to be we only have a few minutes left y'all so what i'd like to do is we'll start with carlos and i just want us to come across what do you think is 
the greatest step that we can take so that we're not in the same place a year from now? And what's your message for our community? You know, it occurred to me sometime today that everyone, there's 300 million people in this country that now have a shared experience. We have all shared this pandemic, this, the, the arrest and death of George Floyd and others. And we all share that experience. And 20 years from now, 30 years, 40 years from now, we're all gonna be able to look back at this and talk to one another at all different levels across races, across ages, across mm -hmm. these different things that, that divide us. That one thing is gonna be with us all. And that's something we can all consciously process and continue thinking about and hopefully slow our days down as we encounter people and we think and process all these lessons that we've learned, all this information that we're gathering. We're going to share this experience for the rest of our lives and we're going to be able to process it and reflect on it as we move forward. And that's what I think about. Bukeka? I have a philosophy which is travel well, live your best life, and know your worth. But in the context of everything that we're talking about, it really rings because when we decide to go out into the world and meet new people and understand cultures, that's a part of, of traveling well. Um, when we talk about live your best life, what does that look like for some people? And the fact that some people can't even imagine what live your best life looks like because they are in a situation of poverty or oppression. Um, but what is the bedrock of all of that for me is to know your worth. And when you know your worth, when you know that you are worthy of having the, uh, all that you want in your life, you're going to speak louder and stand taller and you're not going to allow things to happen to you any longer that you don't deserve. And so I encourage people to our in this uh, time of wondering, am I, do I deserve to have a good, uh, live in a nice neighborhood? Do I deserve to, to feel safe? Yes, know your worth. You are worthy of it. All right, Mr. Mayor, 30 seconds. Things can change. I think after the uh, LA riots, there was kind of this despair that, that came over the 90s, all of that. Will things ever be different? Mm. Is there a way I can change institutions, my city, et cetera? I think now you are seeing folks see that change. You are seeing that opportunity. And I think that is ultimately a positive force going forward. Christy, 30 seconds to you. Um, I would say there's a, kind of the old saying to those who have a lot, they, you know, too much is given or whatever. My thought in that would be if you have enough, you need to be giving more than you have away, you know. And so I want to continue to give myself away until I feel like, you know, that I've done something to make change. Captain Hugo. Um, people don't care what you know. They want to know that you care. <laughs> be genuine. Be authentic. So when you go into office tomorrow, go to your boardrooms, your uh, business meetings, stand up and look around the room. See who's not there. And then figure out why and fix it. Hmm. But don't just make DEI a bumper sticker. Be, be deliberate. Be intentional. Be genuine. I'll leave you guys with that. Captain Hughley with Kansas City Police, Chrislyn Huff, owner of RE Store, which I love on the plaza, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Clinton Lucas, bootcake of Blakemore, the fabulous journalist Carlos Moreno from KCUR. Um, I want to thank you for being part of this conversation, for tuning in for our project. This has been a rewarding partnership. Um, it's no secret that I am a black woman in this community. Um, I am a wife. I am a mother. I am somebody who is deeply um, grieved just by some of the pain that I see. And I will leave you with something that I shared with our friends at KCUR we were talking about this project. Um, I hear from all of these people as part of this, and there's a lot of heartache, guys. There's a lot of hurt, and none of us has the complete or perfect answer. Police officers, families want them to come home at night. You know, Chrissy wants to be able to go back to her store. The mayor wants to run the city well. Bukeka wants to see her community change after decades and generations of protests, and Carlos wants to be able to capture a community that's moving forward. And for me, what I'll leave you with is we're all praying the same prayers. We got to get in the same room. For 41 Action News, KCUR, a sincere thank you to our partners at the Kansas City Public Library. This is the panel discussion for 929, the minutes that move Kansas City. Good night. <laughs>